Welcome back, everybody. Sorry, we are a minute or so late here. I was having some fun uh, problems with my mic, so I will just roll with the headset here. Hopefully, uh, everyone can hear me good on this one. Um, you will notice we are short one uh, host here. Jeb has the family in North Carolina. They do an annual trip back there and go through and reconnect with family, friends, and show his kids what life is like outside of Southern California. So uh, we're going to jump in. He's given me all of his content and slides here. So we're going to go through that. And it will probably be a little bit more numbers data heavy. You know me. I'm a numbers guy. I'm happy to go through any mortgage questions, give you what insights we can on the real estate side of things. But with that, let's jump in here and pull up the slides and see what we got. Hi, Anya. Thank you for joining us. We know we can trust you and Kim and Kel to be here every week. We'll we'll see if we lose any other uh, visitors this week with uh, with Jeb being out. Hopefully, we can hold the audience's attention. So, as you'll see, um, showing inventory, we are into that season of the year where inventory continues rising. Um, interesting note here from Altos Research. That's their note on there that says inventory is still growing quickly. I don't know that I would call that quickly, it kind of matches the normal seasonal trend, but definitely trending up. Um, for Orange County, we are up 45 listings week over week, uh, 2330, and then Huntington Beach down 10 listings. So essentially flat, not a whole lot of movement there. Um, new listings, new properties coming to market. Um, you know, Jeb shows this one every week, and the thing that I always want to say while he's talking about it is amazes me how the uh, scale of, of these lines will change from year to year. But you see the same little dips. So right here, we saw a dip, a little recovery, and then now sliding down. But we saw that each of the previous two years. So very similar seasonality that we've seen over the last couple of years, um, continuing to trend down less people bringing their homes to market, both because of seasonal factors and what we're going to get into here shortly. Interest rates definitely weighing on that people um, feeling more of the lock-in effect as more mortgage rates continue to go higher and higher. Inventory itself is continuing to trend higher, still a little bit below where we were last year, but um, definitely continuing to trend higher, which is seasonal and to be expected. Um, this one here, we've got new uh, 59,000 new pending sales, 14% fewer than last year. So less homes going under contract than what we saw at this time last year, 344,000 total sales pending, 12% fewer than last year. Um, basically also goes to show us that we have less inventory overall. There are less homes, less demand, but less supply uh, available as well. Prices tracking pretty similar to last year. Um, I don't like these comparisons to last year, and I wish we didn't have to make them because what you'll see, the dark red line this year, um, median prices uh, are, are pretty similar to where we were last year, but we were just sensing or getting the feel for that spike in interest rates hitting the market last year, and you saw a decrease in median prices. It's going to be interesting when we come back in November and see if that trend line follows uh, it down like it did last year. Not guaranteed. People um, have the shock and awe of the higher rates has worn off. But what we've seen here, the run up over the last two, three, four weeks, if it continues in that direction, or even just continues to stay at this level, is going to have an impact on median prices. Remembering median prices, that's half of the home sell uh, above that price, half sell below. So when you have people able to afford less because of uh, because of higher interest rates and higher monthly payments, it will push that median price down as those that do buy will move down to cheaper homes that they are able to qualify for. Weekly inventory change, inventory rose from 527 to 534. It's like a 1% change, very minimal. Same week last year, it rose from 556 to 561. So very similar, 5,000 a week. Inventory bottom for 2022 was 240. Inventory peak was 534. For context, active listings for this week in 2015 were 1,187,000. So literally half of where we were in a pretty calm, normal market of 2015. Had pretty much recovered from the crisis of 2008 and hadn't hit anywhere near the mania that we saw during COVID. 
percentage of price decreases, um, again, definitely trending up, uh, but I don't think there's a whole lot to read into this. If you look, we've been at about 33% through 2016, 2017, 2018. Pre-COVID, 2019, early 2020, that had jumped up to about 38%, and that's about where we're at right now. Last year, we saw about a 5% spike, and this year, kind of back in, in this trend. So nothing uh, much to comment on there. Percent of properties with recent price reduction, just another way of looking at it. Price cuts are picking up 37%. Again, that's Altos Research's commentary there. And picking up, yes, absolutely, but matching kind of the seasonal trends that we see. Uh, Jeb threw this one here. I also saw this. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, it's a cool way of presenting data that, that we've shown to you a couple of times previously. But if you look, um, these are by vintage. And by vintage, they mean when were those loans originated and put on the books. So the gold here is the 2023 loans. And so somehow you have some of them down in the fives and we have them all the way up into the eights. I'm assuming those are uh, lower credit score uh, investment properties, those types of things. Um, the dark green 2022 vintage, um, not a ton better, um, but you'll see some of those were still really low, the ones early in the year. And as it trended up, uh, more of them in that, you know, four to 6% range. Um, but this goes to show, I, I didn't, I have some really good slides that I'm going to save for next week. I didn't want to go too deep on the data. And I had kind of a good point that I wanted to make with some of the stuff that we're looking at that will answer some of the questions that you guys were asking last week. So um, where I'll go with this, I have some really good slides that show not only how much equity people have, how low the payments are, how low the payments are relative to incomes, and just why it is incredibly unlikely that we will see widespread forced sales that would cause a large decrease in prices. So we will go through here in a second what could uh, make prices trend down uh, and is a possibility, more of a possibility than we thought even say a month or so ago. And that one would be mortgage rates. So you guys have probably seen, we did on the podcast, I think it was almost exactly a month ago, uh, we did the episode, our mortgage rates going to 8%. And the conclusion was we did not think so, but there definitely was a possibility in looking at the charts and looking at the data and looking at what's going there, definitely a possibility. Now you're seeing things thrown around like, are they going to 9%? Are they going to 10%? Are we going to see double digit mortgages? I saw on Twitter a clip from CNBC. Rick Santelli is their bond market expert, really sharp guy. And he was proposing the idea, not even the idea, the likelihood, his prediction that we will see 10 year treasury yields at 13% at some point in the next 10 years. So, not a straight line up. He said they'll go up, come back, go up, come back. Um, but that is monstrous. If you say, even if you go back to normal spreads of 1.7%, that's telling you a 14% mortgage rate. I don't think that's in any way realistic for a number of reasons that it would take too long to go into. But let's look at what is pushing mortgage rates higher, what the market is going to be looking at going forward, and what we can expect through the rest of the year. So what is moving mortgage rates? Number one, inflation. We've talked about that. We've been talking about that for two years. Inflation has to get under control before we see the Fed step out of the game, before we see the markets start pushing uh, yields lower on treasuries and mortgages. Jobs, this is the secondary piece of it. So we talk about the dual mandate for the Fed. Number one, inflation, price stability. Number two, full employment. So strangely, paradoxically, we have full employment, but now the Fed is trying to engineer less full employment. They don't want a ton of people out of work, but they want more people out of work than what we have right now. And you may say, why would the government want more unemployed people? That's insane. They don't want more unemployed people. They fear that the current low levels of unemployment will lead to wage inflation and cause a price spiral. So that's the issue. Now, the big one here, the red one, is sort of the wild card. We've talked about this here on the show. One of my favorite bond market analysts, Lacey, Lacey Hunt, um, has gone through all of the academic research over the last 20 years that has shown that the historical belief that a bunch of government debt, so the US government spending a ton of money, and we've talked about how quaint it was back in the 80s with one or $2 trillion of debt, thinking that was a big issue when we're at 33 trillion now. Um, but it's shown to actually be deflationary, not inflationary. The sort of the gotcha or the catch there is that over the last 40 years, there has been enough buying of treasuries, enough demand for treasuries to keep yields down, 
and at the same time, the, the debt service is low and we're pulling money away from productive uh, purposes to service that debt, but it's slowing the economy. So we're seeing lower and lower GDP growth and less inflation and lower interest rates because we have plenty of people to buy treasuries. There are questions about that. The market is absolutely questioning that. So we're gonna jump into the data and kind of go through that. So we are here about 512, try and get through these in about 10 minutes and then we'll go through and jump in and answer your questions. I know we've got a bunch of them here. Um, so we'll, we'll get to those. So this is an interesting chart. Uh, this shows inflation. We've talked about the Fed's preferred measure of inflation is personal consumption expenditures and the core level. Core excludes food and energy. And we're gonna talk about that because I know you guys say, hey, my house doesn't get to exclude food and energy. I gotta buy those things. So year over year change, you saw we got this release last Friday, came in at 3.9%. First time it's been under 4% in about a year and a half. Very positive sign, but also still showing inflation about double of what the Fed would like to see. But when we look at it annualized over the last three months, instead of the 12 month number, we're right there at the Fed's inflation target. So a lot of people are looking at this going, hmm, core excludes energy. So recent increases in oil prices won't increase that. The things that are moderating are housing costs over year, owner's equivalent rents, um, cost of shelter, all of that is, is moderating. We're likely to see in the next six months a number really close to, to 2%. So with that, what's the wild card out there? We just said that the core level that the Fed likes to exclude, and they exclude that not because they don't care about it, because they can't really directly control it. They try to take a look at a number and a measure that they are able to directly impact. So the biggest energy cost out there that impacts almost everything that the Fed does not control is oil prices. So you can look at Brent crude, West Texas Intermediate, any of this. So we saw the, the non-core number, the headline number last week with PCE and CPE two weeks prior to that was a little hot. And the headlines are, hey, it looks like inflation is getting back out of control. Inflation in general is not. Energy prices were. So we took a run in the, the where were we, at about 80 bucks the beginning of August, all the way up to, to 93, 84. But as recently as back June, we're 65, 60, 65, 70 bucks uh, a barrel. So that's a, that's a pretty good run up, about 35% over two, three months. The important thing to note there, this can, if it remains at an elevated level, funnel all the way through to other goods and services that do get picked up at that core measure. And how does it do that? Um, oil, uh, petroleum products actually find their way into fertilizer, which finds its way into food. Obviously, in terms of transportation, of getting the, the goods and, uh, I was going to say the goods and services. The services don't need to travel to the market. But getting the goods that you buy, you want to buy a flat screen TV for Super Bowl Sunday, it actually has to use fuel to get there. So it will be interesting to see what that looks like. This is just a different look here at that chart. I drew those green bars in there, just showing that going back to 2014, we've been about 40 to $80 a, a barrel. That is normal. So if we look here and we're back at 84.72, if we dip back into this range, that's par for the course, no issues, no problems. When we get up here at $100 a barrel and above, it is um, a bigger concern. So that, if you're watching at home, definitely pay attention to oil prices. If they moderate and stay under $80 a barrel, not much to worry about in terms of contributing to inflation and keeping inflation from continuing to trend down back to where the Fed wants to see it. So jobs, we talked about the Fed is concerned that if we have super low unemployment, that means the few employees out there looking for the many jobs can say, I'll do your job, but I want $50 an hour for a $20 an hour job or something along those lines. So when we look at that, we've seen this number trending down, but if you look, you can't really pick it up right there at the right side. And we'll see it in the next chart. This week, we had almost a million job openings reported month over month, a million job increase. If that sounds insane, that's because that's insane. There's no way that is a real number. I'm not saying the government manipulated the data. They don't really have any desire or need for it to be reported higher. Um, I'm saying you'll see another chart here that they just aren't collecting the data well um, and not necessarily their fault on that either. So in terms of looking at it, the green line here indeed uh, publishes a jobs report based off of job postings and what they're seeing uh, in the market. And you see that green line basically has been a straight line down. We really haven't had any spikes up yet, a little tiny one there. But magically, the Bureau of Labor Statistics with the, the JOLTS 
there saw a big pop upwards here this week. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, almost everything we're seeing is a tight labor market, but that is loosening and thawing a little bit. So we say, why? Why is this jolts number looking so crazy or non-understandable? They do it by surveying employers and saying, you hiring? Do you have any job openings? What does this look like? And historically, we would get 65% of companies would respond when they would call. So two out of three people would pick up, answer their question, and you could count on the data. Somewhere at the beginning of COVID, uh, companies just stopped answering the phone or stopped answering the survey. And now we're down at 31%. So the question is, how do you get good and valid data? And the other thing that also changed here at the beginning of COVID, more remote jobs, more of those jobs are getting posted in multiple parts of the country if you can work remotely. So the same job can be posted two, three, four, five times. So the job openings are likely getting overstated and they're having to do some extrapolation here to come to these numbers that I just don't know how they're getting anywhere near it. Um, we got the ADP report today. So we had jolts yesterday. The bond market hated it because they're seeing, hey, the Fed wants a weaker jobs market and this is showing a much tighter jobs market. We got ADP today. 89,000 jobs created, that is a really low number. It's the second lowest number. I mean, we're going all the way back here to COVID when we had negative numbers before we get there. That is a spectacularly low, low number and that jives with what we're seeing. So the correlation between ADP and non-farm payrolls, which we get on Friday has been really weak. But if we get a weak jobs report on Friday, there's a very good likelihood that bonds will rally. You're still going to look and go, those rates suck, but they're going to be a lot better than what they looked like a couple of days ago uh, if we get a weak jobs report. So again, this is just another one here showing initial claims. We have some seasonality. Um, you saw Jeb's charts every week show that we get into a period here where more homes come on the market, inventory backs up, homes move more slowly. Well, we can also see that the fourth quarter of the year, we have an increase in initial jobless claims. And that's been pretty darn consistent. The only year that you're seeing funky there is 2020 when people were going back to work in the fourth quarter of the year after COVID kind of started to calm down. So you're looking at 2017, 2018, 2019, 21, 22, and now we're gonna see 2023, but it's a pretty consistent run up. It is very likely in the next three months, we're going to see improving numbers. It's not gonna run uh, unemployment to seven, eight percent, but those numbers are going to improve and the Fed is going to be seeing the message that they want. So we just went through inflation is moderating and trending in the right direction. Jobs are moderating slowly, trending in the right direction. So the last thing we wanted to look at here is supply. What do we mean by supply? Supply of treasuries that get auctioned. That is how the government funds the debt. You say, hey, we have this giant deficit. How does that actually work? Well, they go to market and they say, hey, here's you know $300 billion worth of 10-year treasuries. And there's an auction and there's a price. And when the price is low, because there's not many bidders, the yield is high. And that's what we're seeing as yields go higher and higher because this is supply. This is the inverse of what we're seeing in the housing market. Supply of treasuries continues to go through the roof and we have a finite or even temporarily a decreasing pool of buyers buying or wanting to buy those. So when we look at that, that is one of the reasons and probably the biggest reason for the big run up here from 425 to 4, I think we ended up at 474 or so today, but have been as high as 488 intraday over the last few days. So with that, that to me is the number one issue here over the long haul that will probably be the the bigger issue again historically we've shown that excessive government debt does not lead to higher interest rates does not lead to higher inflation we will see what happens if the buyers just go on strike you guys may have heard the phrase bond vigilantes and that was a phrase in the 1980s when the debt was getting out of control no one wanted to buy the debt yield shot up and the government said hey we got to do something about this and get our spending under control and we may be seeing a, a little bit of that the government is going to figure this out one way or the other fairly soon. This shows from 1960 through 2020, that was a fairly consistent linear trend with some ebbs and flows in terms of, of government expenditures on interest payments. So this isn't how much they owed, this is basically at what rates they financed it and what had to be paid. That red line, we just went 
parabolic there. That, that can't continue forever. Either interest rates have to come down or the government defaults on some of their debt, or they figure out, hey, we have to stop spending more money than we take in, or a combination of all of those. So that's the wild card. That's the big question. Wanted to kind of show you, this is the 10-year treasury. Like I said, we're up about 488. We're about 474 right now. But this is going back to the end of 2021. We saw a run up. We saw a steeper run up kind of trended sideways. Then the fourth quarter of last year, we saw this big run up. Again, first quarter of this year trended sideways. And now for, I think it goes back to about March, maybe May, going back to May, that's almost a straight line up. Um, the reasons for it uh, can be debated, but they are what they are. Long story short, if you are in the market right now and you're buying a home, keep it locked. There's really no reason until we see something approximating a downtrend somewhere here, which we haven't seen for the better part of two years, to think in terms of, of not locking an interest rate. This is mortgage-backed securities. So when we see these coming down, that's not the yield, that's the prices. So as prices go down, then uh, the yield or the interest rate that you're paying goes up. This is the last couple of days that jolts opening, uh, job openings and labor turnovers uh, survey that came out yesterday. That was bad. This pushed us. This is a bad down channel. But generally, what we've been able to count on is when we hit the bottom of this channel, then you might be able to float because you'll run up to the top of the channel before coming back down. We broke out of the channel, tried to run up in it today. Um, there are some technicals pointing towards a, a reversal that should get us back in this channel. We'll see. So next week, we'll talk about the, the jobs report and what that did. What does that mean in real terms? 774 today uh, per Mortgage News Daily. And the, remember, that's for well-qualified borrowers. If you have a lower credit score, you're buying an investment property, you are in the eight. So hopefully the comments are not, not already here. I, I got quoted in eight or I've seen rates in the eight. We talk about the rates that get quoted in the reputable sources for the best qualified borrowers. And those have not hit 8%, but they're getting really, really, really close. Um, FHA is showing over seven. You should be able to still get those in the high sixes, VA as well. So if you're in the market, that's what you're looking at. All right. Thank you guys for bearing with me. It took 23 minutes. I was hoping to get through that in, uh, in a little less time for you. But let's jump in here without a... Uh, co-presenter here it makes it uh, a little bit tough to get back through all these questions kim you have a very good question that i do not know how to ask it says why are my student loans keep falling off my credit report and then add it again after about a month the only reason they should fall off is if you're getting them forgiven. So if you're in a public servant loan forgiveness program and you've reached the forgiveness point, um, that would be the only reason why they should fall off. They should never fall off temporarily and come back. Is it possible that the servicing is getting transferred or it could be a glitch in the servicer's software while they're going this, through this transition to repayments starting? Patrick's making jokes. He's got a good one here. Why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. So hopefully we don't, we don't see eight and nine. Hopefully we see it turn back around. Um, Robert asked a super easy question here. A good one. If the government had to shut down, would that have affected any of the government loan programs, FHA and VA? Yes. Yes. While the government is shut down, they cannot insure any loans. Um, most lenders will continue funding loans knowing that the government won't, won't remain closed forever and they can get them insured afterwards. Um, but they are taking a risk doing that. So it absolutely could impact the market. So we got C. Pimpin back with his Seahawks hat. Got to like that. Seahawks had a real good showing Monday night. Uh, so congratulations. Do you see people advertising their 2.5% assumable rates only, then the house second? Um, we, on Tuesday, we just recorded this episode on assumable mortgages. I believe one of you asked for it last week. So if you're here, congratulations. We loved the idea and we put that right to the top of the line of episodes. So Jeb and I recorded that Tuesday before he headed to North Carolina and it will be coming out next Tuesday. But I don't see people advertising them, but I'm not looking at a lot of homes in those prices. I'm not looking at homes at all. I'm not looking to buy. And the ones that Jeb's looking at are above the price range where it's going to be an FHA, VA, or USDA loans. All three of those are 100% assumable. Most adjustable rate mortgages, also assumable. But most of your Fannie Freddie loans, most of your jumbo loans, fixed rate, never going to be assumable. So I'm just not looking in that space. If I were a seller and I were open to it, even if it was just a conversation starter, I would absolutely advertise it. Um, it's a 
it's a very limited market. Most people don't have the, the money to cover the equity gap. We talked about this uh, on the podcast, I'll give you a little sneak preview. If someone at the beginning of COVID bought their home for $300,000, that thing's gone up 40 to 50%. So it's a 425 to $500,000 house now. During that time, they've paid their mortgage down fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. So two eighty against say four fifty or even four twenty five. You have a hundred forty five thousand dollar gap. If you're an FHA buyer, three and a half percent down, VA USDA zero percent down, you don't have a chunk of cash sitting there to cover that. So either you're looking at a seller carry, the seller can carry that difference if they don't want their money. So if you have someone that's retiring, not moving on to another home. Maybe they would like a source of income at that higher interest rate, um, but most likely you're looking at having to get a second mortgage. Um, the best case for you would be if you were someone that's in the market for a conventional loan, you're putting 30, 40% down, and that is what it takes to cover that gap, then absolutely, even if you took someone's FHA mortgage with a 0.85 mortgage insurance rate, if it's at 3%, that's a 3.85% effective rate, you're absolutely going to be stoked on that. So thanks for the question. Definitely, if you are interested in assumable loans, make sure you check out the podcast either on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the YouTube channel at The Educated Homebuyer. So Joyce, I am embarrassed to not have the accurate answer on this one because there was a change, but I don't think it changed. So the question is, should veterans pay for pest inspection under a VA loan? They now can pay for clearance. It used to be not allowable for the veteran to pay for the termite work to get a clearance. And again, and sadly don't have the accurate answer here, but thankfully the pest inspection is generally fairly cheap. Um, so if I give you the wrong answer, it won't impact you too badly. Um, I believe you should be able to pay for it, but it is totally negotiable. And a lot of times uh, the pest inspection company, knowing that there's likely to be work, will do the inspection for free. So Anya has a really, really good point. Usually Jeb does this, but I will follow through. We have 158 of you here, so pretty consistent with what we normally have, even when uh, the big boss man is in, in the chair next to me. So appreciate you guys showing up, but basically Anya is asking for you to hit that like button. So we would love to have as many or more likes as Jeb gets when he's here to let him know that we're uh, able to keep the uh, ship afloat while he is gone. I'm actually sad that he's not here. I don't know that any of you pay enough close attention to know that I have a different lens on my camera this week. Jeb was tired of my head looking bigger than his because I had a 35 millimeter lens on my camera. And so he said, you got to get a 24 millimeter so that we, we look the same. So this week, if he were here, we would have similar sized melons, although mine's probably still bigger than his. So that is where we're at. Now let's find some more good questions here. Oh, it's actually a good one. I like this one. Tom says, currently looking for a home, putting about 50% down, financing 450,000, great credit between 775 and 805, current job 20 years, um, and job change. How would this impact me getting a competitive rate. Job change won't impact your interest rate at all. Um, you can Google Fannie Mae loan level price adjustments and you'll see the matrix change of jobs nowhere to, to be found. So it's binary, yes or no. Your income is good and valid and we can use it to qualify you or no good and we can't use it, but it does not go into your, uh, your interest rate. What are the things that do go into it? How much you're putting down? So the more you put down, the better it's gonna get. Used to say anything with 40% or more down is gonna get the absolute best terms. Now at some credit scores, that can be as, as much as 70% down, a 30% loan to value before you get the best terms. But that's generally for people with low scores and or doing cash out. So a purchase with a really good credit score, 50% down, you are absolutely gonna get the best terms uh, available. Actually, this is a good reminder. This is you guys really don't know how much tougher this is trying to, to do this uh, to do this solo. So, uh, Tom, probably already well into the game. But if you are looking to get connected with a professional, Jeb has a network of realtors throughout the country that are truly uh, very, very good and completely vetted. We work with a lot of them here on the West Coast in the states where I do loans, where Jeb refers out a realtor and we handle the financing for them. And I can tell you, I've never had a bad experience. The worst realtor that we've worked with through Jeb would still fall well into that top 20% tier category. So uh, if you're looking for a mortgage professional, again, we have a handful of folks. I cover most of the Western United States. Um, we have a handful of other trusted folks that Jeb can connect you with that cover the remaining uh, states in the continental US. So I'll leave that up there. 
can click the link, but let's go. Robert has a, a question, uh, not near, really an area of expertise for me, but um, if these large unions keep striking and getting wage increases, doesn't that just increase inflation? Um, if they get them, yes. Um, we're just, again, it's not an area of expertise for me, but I, I don't disagree with your logic there. Um, I don't think they're going to get the gains that they want. Like if you go back and look at what happened with the, the Riders Guild, they ended their strike. They got some concessions. They got some good things. Um, at the end of the day, was it beneficial? I mean, some of the things that are just outright, to me, negative for their position going forward. Um, I don't think most people like being out of work and giving up money unless they feel like there's a clear win at the end. So if we saw win after win after win, that was a clear win for unions and we saw more unions going out on strike and getting more wage increases, absolutely. Don't know that it's gonna happen, but definitely a, a good question there. Okay, this one, actually, we hadn't got this much towards the middle of the year when rates had kind of leveled off. This was a little bit easier, but Ryan says, um, doing a new construction house should be done in November, December. When should I lock in my rate? The home builder's lender wants almost $16,000 to buy my rate down to six and a half. Hopefully, you don't have to buy the interest rate down to six and a half. Um, Again, go back to the top of the show. We talked about mortgage rates. Uh, I am of the belief that rates will be moving lower, that the long-term trends that lead rates lower will come back into play sooner rather than later, but that may mean two, three, four, five years down the line. So if you can handle a higher payment and keep the $16,000, I would lean towards that. The more important question that you had there is uh, when when do I lock it? So New construction is unique in that we have somewhat of a moving target. I would ask how consistently they're hitting their targets. Um, maybe see how many times through your process it has got pushed back. If it has got pushed back, not always up to the builder, not always under their control. They can have supply chain issues. I know we had a builder here in California. I think it was garage doors they weren't able to get or garage door openers. It was something silly and they weren't able to sell a chunk of homes or close on them. So um, interesting decision, but in general, I tell people that you would love to get within a 30-day window before locking the interest rate, but what we've seen over the last few weeks, anyone doing that, I'll kind of give you guys an example. Spoke to someone over the weekend. She wasn't super happy that over the week that they had been considering refinance options. They have to refinance um, for reasons I won't go into, but they weren't super stoked that over the week we'd been talking that rates had gone up and took a couple of days to think about it. And then yesterday or Monday and Tuesday, Rates jumped up at least another quarter percent. So rates can move fairly quickly. Getting inside a shorter window will save you just a little bit of money. This is a dangerous market. Um, you know, I might, if I were in your shoes, be willing to kind of get through the non-farms payroll figure on Friday and see what happens. But even that is a risk. If they're offering a long-term rate lock at a reasonable price, it's absolutely something to consider because we've seen such big moves in, in interest rates. Carlos says, is it better to buy a house at a high interest rate or is it better to wait and buy a house at a higher price but a lower interest rate? It all comes down to what does that do for your lifestyle? We've shown the charts uh, over the last month or two of what the average loan to value is right now. Average loan to value is up into the 40s, especially in more expensive coastal areas. With that being the case, I would look at it and say, am I comfortable at that payment? Is it going to change and impact my life? If you're comfortable with it and you believe that, that prices are going to go higher and that interest rates are going to come down, that scenario is ideal. You get in, you start building up some equity, you get a little bit of appreciation over the next few years, two, three, four percent a year. Even at, at 3%, over a three-year time frame, that home is 10% more expensive. So if you're in an area with a $500,000 home, that's $50,000 more. Um, again, we've gone through the data a million times here. We do not have the recipe for large-scale price decreases. If interest rates were to go to 9 9.5%, I think massively it's going to decrease volume, even from where we're at. We've talked about 4 million annual home sales being sort of a floor, we would see that floor give way and sales volume would go even lower. But I do believe that those people that had to sell, that didn't have the option of posting up and waiting for a better opportunity for themselves to move on, um, would have to come off their price some. That's really the only recipe that I see there because we're not gonna see widespread 
forced sales. So to put it into context, one of the reports that Jeb and I follow, a guy here in Orange County, tracks MLS data, and he went back to 2008 and showed that at that time, 44% of the active inventory in the multiple listing service was foreclosed properties. Today, we have six. I don't even know what percent six is. It's way, 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 way less than 1%. So from 44% to under 1%. And it hasn't trended up. It hasn't moved. We're a year plus into this. You know, we first started seeing the impacts of, of higher interest rates summer of 2022. Saw them all the way through last year. People stepped back, paused, looked around, and home prices dipped. Home prices have dipped. I had the chart today. There's seven or eight markets throughout the country. Um, really, only Austin has had a significant decrease. The rest of them were about four to five percent um, below peak levels. And again, for most homeowners, they rode 40 to 50 percent increases. So a four to five percent decrease isn't all that much in the grand scheme of things. So I tend to agree with you that prices will inch upwards. I agree with you that in the next one, two, five years, we're going to have an opportunity to get a much better interest rate than we have right now. Probably not two, three percent, but a lot better than seven and a half. So from that perspective, as long as you're comfortable with the monthly payment, I would lean towards buying now. But it's totally a personal decision. Buy when it's right for you. Know your market. You know, if you're in Austin and Austin's down nine percent, although it's leveled off a little bit, Phoenix down four or five percent, leveled off and improving some. Those are the things that you you want to keep an eye on. So Joyce has a, another question here. So when negotiating on home price, is only ten thousand down on the price a good deal in this market? Original asking price four hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's an impossible question to to answer, um, just because it truly comes down to individual markets. What is happening in those markets? That individual property, even in a market that has seen a dip, I guarantee you there are homes in Austin that this month will sell above list price. So you can't just look and say, hey, year over year, home prices are down 9.2% and you're asking this much, so I wanna cut a percentage off of it. If someone has a really desirable house, a great location, a unique floor plan, a wonderful school district, my home is unique in that we are the only single story home in our neighborhood with a three car garage. In all of Huntington Beach, there were only three tracks built with single story cars with a three car garage. I used to say that it was like old people, like 60, 65 year old men that love that. And now that I've turned 50, I just say it's just men, men like three car garages. So us older distinguished gentlemen like three car garages and we will always get a premium for those properties. So you have to think in terms of how long has the house been on the market? How desirable is it? How unique is it among other properties available? If there's five or six others like it, probably telling you you're in a position to negotiate on price. If it's the only one like that, if it's the only single story car a house with a three car garage, you're probably not going to be able to negotiate on it because there are multiple people out there looking for that. And that may be lakefront, that may have a mountain view. It may be any number of things in your area. Could be a school district for those of you with, with young kids. So that is uh, the number uh, or the, the my take on that. You really have to rely on your real estate professional to run the number, look at other comps that are available, look at the most recent sales to see how quickly they sold and for what percentage of, uh, of the price it goes for. So Chris, Chris says, big fan. I appreciate that. But sorry to say interest rates will hit 10% before we know it. The Fed won't cut until 25 or 26. Been in mortgage since 2006. Elections in 2024 are going to be interesting. No one can tell you you're wrong. I couldn't disagree with you more. Could they hit 10%? I could see 10% far more than I could see before the Fed cutting between 2025 and 2026. Um, we show the charts here every week. The Fed is delusional thinking that this economy is wonderfully strong and that inflation remains high and that we're not going to see a recession sooner rather than later. Hopefully they're right and it's very minor and very short with very little impact to people. But history has shown, it's a chart that I didn't include tonight, that the Fed is way overly optimistic always, every time. So when they tell you higher for longer, not gonna cut, I just, I just don't believe it. The data is telling us it's not there. But I'll tell you, there are smart people out there, you being one of them, Chris, since you like us. Uh, but uh, seriously, 
there are smart people out there that believe rates are are going higher. So absolutely, um, it's it's definitely possible. Sort of along the the same lines, uh, one of our other big VIP viewers here, Clips and Easy, says, I keep hearing the Fed will cut rate by next year. Why would they cut? Wouldn't this lead to more inflation? Also, can a builder pay for both closing costs and down payment for a buyer? Lots of questions there. They will not cut. So kind of going back to what Chris said, they will not cut until they have to. Right now, they don't have to. Yesterday, we get a JOLTS report that looks like, hey, the jobs report is really strong. Last week, we get PCE at 3.9%, headline even higher. There's nothing telling the Fed they should or would need to cut now. So should we expect it in the fourth quarter? No. Should we expect it in the first quarter? No. But the data that we're watching are leading indicators. If you look at the economic, the index of economic leading indicators, clearly trending down. It's going to come down sooner rather than later. But until it does, the Fed absolutely will not cut. So it's not a matter of leading to more inflation. If they were to cut right now, they could have stopped 50 basis points ago. And I don't think it would have led to any more inflation. We've seen high real interest rates. So we went from negative real interest rates where inflation was way above where they had the Fed funds rate to now we have inflation has come down, Fed funds raise up. We have strongly positive real interest rates. So as inflation comes down, they're tightening without tightening. So if inflation comes down from 3.9 to 3.5%, if they cut down from five and a quarter to 4.75, they didn't really cut interest rates. The real cost of, of interest above and beyond inflation has not changed. So you're absolutely on the right track with your thinking there. Chris is on the right track with what he's wanting to watch, but we just have to watch it play out. Uh, you know, we all have our ideas and our opinions and the things that we're looking at to form those opinions. Hopefully your market uh, opinion is validated by data and we'll watch it all uh, unfold and see how it plays out. You know, it is, has been much different and taken much longer than I expected two years ago. So if you had me pencil it out and look at it, we could sit and go, Josh, you're a dummy. You've been very wrong. So certainly not saying we have a crystal ball, but I do believe strongly that we're looking at the right data and over time it will bear itself out. And I'll go back to, you guys have heard me talk about Lacey Hunt. Lacey Hunt's 80 years old, 81 years old, has been watching bonds forever, smartest guy I know in the bond business. And he has been very wrong for the last 18 months. And he will tell you he's been very wrong. And he will tell you that I will be right sooner rather than later. Doesn't mean that he will, but it is a smart guy. So both of you guys uh, appreciate those thoughts and questions there. Elay says he noticed some who bought in 21 now selling those homes. Some sit on the market 30 plus days, given they bought at a 3% rate, uh, 3 to 4% rate are these buyers now sellers losing if they sell below the original purchase price. Um, well, let's let's look at it. So if you bought in 21, we were seeing positive appreciation, almost double digit all the way through the middle of 2022. So say it went up eight, 9% and say you're in one of those markets that dropped from the peak four to 5%. You're still up three to 4%. Now you're gonna go is three to 4% enough to walk away without taking a loss? And the answer is probably no. You're looking at four to six to 7% in some markets in terms of real estate commissions, one to 2% in closing costs plus your closing costs on the way in. So anyone that bought in 21 that isn't in a market that had really rapid appreciation and has kind of hung out or, or had the two, three, 4% appreciation this year that most markets have seen on top of it are probably not coming out ahead. And those that are in the best situation are probably just breaking even from, from there. So that's why we always talk about have a long-term time horizon. You want to be there for five to seven years. You don't want to rely on magic in a home bumping up 10, 12, 15% in a year. We had two, three years of it during COVID, but that is not normal. Um, we know that over the long haul, home prices will exceed the rate of inflation in terms of manual, annual appreciation, but double digits, it shouldn't and, and can't for very long be at that level. So uh, interesting thought there. So let me get back here, see if we can find some more of these questions. Every time I try to scroll up, someone makes a, a new comment and it digs them back down here. Let's see. Eli, I am not sure I'm following on this. He's most likely to take the L. 
one, me waiting until December to January for 6% rates with no points, or two, those who subscribe to Apple TV only to watch Messi play in the MLS. So, Ile, I am not the greatest soccer fan, but I follow enough that I think you're saying that Messi has that pretty pink jersey and rarely plays, even though he does play spectacularly uh, when, when he does. <laughs> All right, we have a genius here that wants to pick a fight. So we'll throw this out here. Here's misinformation. I don't know who back after this says every single loan can be transferred. Stop telling people false information. You are correct. Every single loan can be transferred. Every Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan, every fixed rate loan has what's called a due on sale clause. They've been legal since 1982. All loan docs contain them. And if you transfer me your house and I get to keep your loan, the lender can call it due anytime they want. The first month, the 12th month, 20 years from now, at any point, you are no longer the owner of the property and you are the borrower. That sale triggered the due on sale clause. I'm not sure why anyone would pick this hill to die on um, because it's an easy one, easy, easy question, easy answer. So the loans that are literally and truly assumable that don't have a due on sale clause that can be assumed by going through the current lender servicer and being approved for the uh, assuming the loan are FHA, VA and USDA loans and some adjustable rate mortgages. So thanks for playing. Go back. Um, you can't wait till this episode comes out filled with misinformation. Listen to all 30 minutes of it. That will help the algorithm. And I'm sure we'll get more comments there also telling us how you don't understand what a due on sale clause is. Miles has some more thoughts here on interest rates. I'm taking a bet interest rates will rise till mid next year and stay there for years to come. Um, I would agree more with the, the first part of it than the second part. Um, I can definitely see a formula for rates continuing to trend up for three, six, nine months. Um, I don't think they're going to stay there. Uh, we are getting to a point where after 40 years of nothing but downward interest rates, I totally understand why people are thinking that. Totally understand why over the last two, three months, we're getting more and more experts that are comfortable coming out and saying rates are going to go much, much higher. Um, it gets headlines. You can make a case for it and they may end up being right. I don't think they are. Um, we've shown the chart on here before that the government only has about, I think it's 18% of spending is in any way discretionary. Everything else is allocated, whether it's social security, Medicare, military defense spending, already allocated. So if we went from 3% uh, average rate on government debt to 6%, which we're gonna hit in the next year or so at current trends, uh, and then that goes up higher to 9%, you rapidly eat into all available government funds. The government does have the ability to push down the cost of their borrowing and push down cost of interest rates. We've seen sort of the, the downside of that, absolutely can and does trigger inflation. We're gonna see that, that push pull over the next few years. And, and some really smart people are saying, that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna have this, hey, we fight inflation and we get it under control, and then we have to lower rates to make government borrowing more affordable, inflation gets back out of control. We actually showed a chart last week that showed historically how that has happened. I don't necessarily agree that it's going to, but definitely some, some mechanisms there where you could see that. Um, Gregory Gazzano says, what's the timeline of when you see housing prices in the Bay Area lower, or do you see that even happening? Well, if you look, I wish I had the chart. I don't have it here where I can share it, but let's look. Here, I do have it up the market. So Austin was number one. It's down 11.6 from the peak. Phoenix at down 4.8. And we get to San Francisco, California, down 4.3%, but up 1% year over year. So at the worst, it uh, year to date, it's up 6%, year over year, 1.9. So it had dipped a good chunk um, and has recovered a, a chunk. So I, I look at it and it's not an area of expertise for me. It's always been a very volatile market. We have some friends who had very good friends in the Bay Area, super cool house in about 2002-ish. And when you had the, the tech crash, their home dropped like $100,000 in value. And we're like, that's crazy because nowhere else is seeing these big decreases in value. And people were like, ah, see, Bay Area homes overvalued. And you know what happened with tech, with tech workers, with tech wages, and that home's probably worth four or five times what it was at that time. So hard to say, um, it really is gonna come down to the, the economy. 
uh, you know, if enough of those tech companies stay and they pay and higher rates don't impact their venture funding and that stock option regime that led people to say, hey, I'll take a job for $150,000, even though I'm worth 300 and hope for the monster payday of two, five, $10 million payoff from stock options, which I can then go buy a house with and push prices up. So lots of weird stuff in that market that we don't really see in, in other areas. All right, I'm going back here. I think we got most of them. So this one here, dragging my baggage, really comment, not a question. I'm gonna rent my house out when I move, big rents out there. Um, absolutely true. Uh, on the apartment side, we're seeing some leveling off and even some decreases in rents, but the single family space, still seeing rents go up. Um, if you have one of those ultra low interest rates and you can hold on to it, a lot of cash flow from from that perspective. So unfortunately, we we hurt we, we hurt Greg's hopes for the future. He said, "Well, I live in the worst place on earth. I'll never be able to buy." Um, I I don't I I hate to hear someone have that that perspective. Um, I've had a lot of people through the years, we get weird markets. I've, I've been through probably three of these boom markets and people get super discouraged and say, hey, it's not gonna happen for me. Um, just keep your head up and, and do what's right. What do we talk about? What is doing what's right? Focus on your earnings, career advancement, job advancement, do everything you can on that front. Make sure you're saving. Saving uh, tax advantaged accounts, 401k, IRA, Roth IRA if you're young. And then invest, invest as, as well as you can. You know, this is not an investment channel. Jeb and I don't go into that space. We do different things with our money that we like to check out and, and look at that would be of interest to you guys, but it's not really an area of expertise like housing and mortgage are. But I really just, uh, let's say this, let's say you're right and you never get the opportunity to buy a house. I'm still right. Earn, save, invest and it will put you into a good place. We did an episode on the podcast on budgeting. That's a super boring topic to most people, but I just don't think most people give it enough credit and do what they should to know where their money is going. Every time I go back, I don't do it as well as I should. Jeb doesn't do it as well as he should, but at least a couple times a year, we both will go back through our spending and we have that conversation once or twice a year. Like, you are not gonna believe this. I have this, that, the other that we paid a ton of money for. I'm embarrassed to say, I will make an embarrassing confession to you. In the middle of COVID, we had uh, uh, something that, we made a change to an account for something that we used for the business. And at that time, the expense was about $5,000 a month. The vendor did not shut it off when we said switched from this account to this account. They left both of them running. We were going to build $10,000 a month for almost six months before it got caught. There are smaller scale things like that that are happening in your life and your budget if you're not regularly looking at it. And there are awesome tools out there, paid tools, free tools. I would lean towards a, a cheap paid tool just because the free ones are generally trying to sell you everything under the sun. Um, the paid ones are too, just not quite as, as much. Eli, this is a good one here. Um, if home sales chug along at their current low number compared to previous years, do you see rents increasing or decreasing? How might rents impact sales? Um, if rents were to come down, that's sort of the easy part of that question. If rents were to come down while interest rates are high and owning homes, like part of the reason why people are still saying, hey, these mortgage rates suck, that housing payment sucks, I still wanna do it because rents suck worse. If rents got less egregious and more affordable, there would be more people that would just say, hey, this makes more sense for me. Just remember, uh, kind of going back to that earn, save, invest, if you make that decision, totally valid decision, just make sure you are saving and investing. Don't rent and spend every dime that you have. If you're a homeowner, over time, you're going to build up equity. I have clients that are 55, 65 years old. They do not have a nickel to their name, but they have 300, 500, $700,000 of home equity. As a renter, you are guaranteed to never have that. It doesn't mean you can't build up an awesome 401k, an awesome Roth IRA and put yourself in a good position. Um, so do I see rents increasing or decreasing? It's still a supply and demand issue. Um, 
I, I think we'll, we have more renters than we have things for them to rent, just like we have more potential home buyers than we have homes for them to buy. So that would be my thought going forward is that uh, rents will moderate. We're not going to see the, just like home prices can't continue rapidly appreciating like they had the last several years, rents can't do that either. And we're already seeing that in the data. We're strongly seeing that in the data. And I would expect that to continue. Um, if I'm correct and we hit a recession or at least a seriously slow patch in the economy next year, people won't have that discretionary income. That will put pressure on rent. So all of these things do tend to correct. Benzo, this is a great question. And I'm gonna pitch one of Jeb's videos. I think he released it this week. I'm at 3%, but I wanna move. Is it a good idea right now? I don't know that good idea is the right question. Um, it may be the right answer. You may You may have to move but you may not. If you're a single person in a two bedroom condo and you're like, you know what? I'd like a single family house with a nice attached three car garage. I'm going to go do that. Financially, it probably doesn't make great sense. But if you're in that two bedroom condo and you got a wife and three kids, you might be saying it doesn't matter. I'm going to lose my mind and my kids are going to lose their minds here. So more goes into it than just the finances of it. But go to Jeb's channel. You may be watching here on Jeb's channel. Go to the videos and check out. He is going through this right now. Jeb has a sub 3% interest rate. He's got a 1,700 square foot house. He has three rapidly growing boys um, and they are active. They're awesome kids, but they are active. And they're just saying, we need more room. We need more room. And he's having a struggle deciding what to do with that. And he made a video walking through it. And it's going to be better information than, uh, than I would ever be able to give you a better answer on that. Uh, Sir Calvin 83 says, got a home in Austin at 2.7% and bought last year in San Antonio at 4%. Think of buying raw land now. Any thoughts on how land behaves versus improved properties? No one ever talks about that. Um, I would say simply it comes back to supply and demand once again. So if it's a piece of desert land out in the middle of West Texas, where we've got tumbleweeds and wind blowing through, I would not do it. Um, but if it's an area that's growing, that the uh, economy is thriving and people are wanting to build homes, it can be a good investment. Land is unique in that it's gonna come with a property tax bill every year. If you finance it, you're gonna have a mortgage payment on it. And for the most part, unless you can get people to pay you to farm it or put uh, RV parking or something along those lines, it is not going to bring in any income. So it is a cost while it is not giving you any rent yield. So those are the things that I would look at um, from, from that perspective. So comes back and says he's looking in the hill country. So all I know is Texans love the hill country. So I'm assuming it's awesome. Um, if it's awesome and desirable and it's an awesome piece of land that someone would want to build on and you feel like it could appreciate, definitely uh, agree that it can be a good investment. It's just very different than buying a house. And most importantly, congratulations on getting the two homes and owning them at very good interest rates. <laughs> Kel had a very good point. Just an observation, Josh. The internet didn't glitch today. Maybe Jeb's connection. Maybe Jeb just sucks all of the energy off of our internet connection, and it uh, it goes out on us. I'm going to tell him. Um, Joyce, uh, why doesn't Jeb consider renting his current house? He's gone through the number six ways to Sunday. Um, unless he wants to go into savings, basically retirement savings. Um, it's it's going to have to come from his current house. So while it would have very positive cash flow if we do a three or four hundred thousand dollar HELOC to pull the money out of there, now it's slightly cash flow negative, and he has a smaller down payment on what he needs to purchase, and the monthly payment is even bigger. So I think he goes through that in the video. So if you guys are interested, go and and check that out. Um, Another one here, Brian Espinoza has got an interest of two and a quarter. I'm glad I bought before all these hikes. I don't know that that's super helpful to our friends who are renting and wanting to buy. Um, don't know that that any of us will ever get a bite at the apple on that one again. Both Jeb and I sit and we say, if we knew then what we knew know now, we would have borrowed more. We would have taken more money out of our houses because there are good opportunities and good investments out there. Um, when you can borrow that cheap, but that opportunity is uh, is no longer an option. So it's six o'clock straight up. We've been here for an hour. We've got 170 of you. That is awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate all of the support, but um, I can hang out another 15, 20 minutes. If you guys have any questions, throw them up here. Uh, I'm digging back through here and wanna make sure I didn't miss any of them. If you did miss, I know Jeb uh, 
doesn't like you guys to repost questions. But if you asked a question and I missed it, go ahead and, uh, and throw it up and I will make sure we get back to it. Alpha Core, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Will housing crash finally? I don't think housing is ever going to crash. That doesn't mean that I don't think home prices are never going to come down. They absolutely could. But go back earlier, I want to say it was about 20 minutes ago. We kind of talked about what would have to happen for that to happen. For them to crash, we would have to have a volume, a big volume of people distressed with no choice but to sell. Historically, prior to 2007, we had never seen Na nationwide decreases in home prices on a year over year basis. And so people like to say, well, home prices are sticky to the upside. People will just post up and stay there and not sell at a loss. And when we say sell at a loss, we're not talking about that person we're talking about in 2021 that they bought their home and it may not have gone up enough that they can walk away. We're talking about the reality is I bought my home for 580,000 20 years ago. It's worth almost three times that. If it dropped $200,000 and I sold it, I would think I was losing money because I didn't sell it anywhere near that peak value. So there is truth to that. People are hesitant to sell at a loss. People are hesitant to sell and give up their ultra low interest rates. So there's a million reasons why people do not want to sell. So there's going to have to be very compelling reasons for them to do so and to do so at scale where the supply overwhelms the demand, not just the willing demand. There's always people willing to buy houses, but able demand, people that can qualify and will sign on the dotted line. So could we see a correction? Could we see a prolonged period of sideways movement in the market? Absolutely. Um, could we see a little bit of a downturn? Yes. Do we see a crash? I just, honestly, I don't see a formula for it. And the things that you would have to propose for there to be a formula for a crash would be so bad that anyone hoping or wishing for it, you would have bigger problems than saying, hey, this is my entry point into the housing market. So we got a good one here. Greg, back with another question. Well, first, Greg, we're going to get to your question. But Kirsten, VIP viewer, says hit the likes, people. I forgot we're trying to get more likes than the shows when Jeb's here so that he can show that, that you guys like uh, like the, the number data shows when he uh, goes out on vacation and takes his wife to Montana or takes the kids to North Carolina. But Greg has a really good question. And this one came into a text from uh, a viewer today, came up with this one. Thoughts on DPA, specifically the Dream for All program. So if you're outside of California, put your earmuffs on. Dream for All is California only. It was basically the government would give you a silent second for 20% down, um, made a lot of people qualify for a lot more home. 20% um, down is a big down payment. The money went really quickly and most of it went to people who could have bought a home otherwise. So the government looked at that and said, hmm, we had a good plan. We had terrible execution. So they have authorized funding for another round of Dream for All. But they said, go back to the drawing board and close some of these loopholes. So the reality is most of the people that I talked to made pretty darn good money. Um, and it wasn't the people that they intended on helping. Um, so from the, I don't, I don't want to get political and go down that path, but some of the stuff they were saying was crazy. Like there were too many white people that got the money. Um, I agree there were too many people who could otherwise buy a home and we need to be helping disadvantaged people who wouldn't otherwise be able to get into a home. And my guess is that's what we're going to see when the guidelines come back. It will still be a pretty decent down payment, probably, possibly not 20%, um, but much more restricted in terms of income. So we're helping people who otherwise couldn't buy a home. So now you're going to ask, you're in the Bay Area, someone in Los Angeles, someone in Orange County. Cool. How do you make little enough to qualify for any program and be able to buy a home in those areas, that's the tough part. Like to me, you're almost saying, hey, if you're willing to move to a lower cost of living area within California and you make less money and you can make that move, we will help you finance a home purchase. It's definitely a, a tough one. Patrick says, great show, very informative as always. Stay happy and healthy, everyone. So he's wishing all of you happiness and health. So appreciate it, appreciate the kind words. Another question here, Naughty 181 says, this is random or maybe, but do you think a rural neighborhood in New Jersey with, with what's going on now, can it see a loss in value come time to refinance to a lower rate in the future? Any area can, truly any area can. You know, you go back three years in time, the Bay Area, if I said, hey, you can have a house for appreciation purposes only for the next 
five years. All of you would have said the Bay Area, but it's number four here on the list for, for home price decreases. So all areas can. So you talk about a rural area. Rural, by definition, has lots of land. So someone could just as easily build a home as buy your home. Um, most people are not wanting to live in rural areas. So be super careful uh, with that. Polarity. Uh, I'll throw this up. Jeb hates the word crash because it would prove him wrong. I don't think either one of us hate the word crash. It's not a matter of hating it. It's a matter of there is no plausible mechanism for it to happen. And in general, let me let me clarify. Let, let's actually put numbers on that. To me, a crash is 20% or more decrease in home prices. And I just like literally something so horrific would have to happen to the economy that we would all have much bigger problems than worrying about being happy that there's sort of a, a, a second bite at the apple to get a home at a better price. And I think that's where I don't think most people are wishing for bad things for the economy or bad things for homeowners, but people who have got priced out of the market say, I just want another shot. I want another shot. I want the merry-go-round to come back around and me to get an entry point. And I could totally understand and respect and appreciate that. Um, I just don't think most of them are thinking and understanding what it would take to see that dip. 2007, 2008 was a horrific moment in time that will never be repeated. So when you come of age during that, it's easy to, to look back and see, I just need that to happen again and get a reset like we went from 2008 to 2010 and then I would be able to buy a home that I would be happy with. It's not That's not the cycle. It's not the way it works. We've talked on the show here before that there are cyclical and non-cyclical markets. I think with the advent of sort of the monoculture with the internet, with cable TV, there are more cyclical markets than there used to be. But even at that, the cycles that we've had in Southern California historically, absent 2007, 2008, are more common or more what we should expect going forward. It would be a correction of 5 to 10 to 12 percent correction versus one of these big crashes. That was a once in a lifetime calamity that I just think it's foolish to think that it would come back again, despite the fact that it may be what you need or want um, to get into the market. It would be so catastrophic for the economy for for something to happen that would cause that, that it may not put you in a position to be able to buy a home regardless. So Kevin says, what are FHA loans requirements and what would you say are the biggest downsides? Thank you so much for giving financial advice. No, I appreciate you guys being here and listening. I didn't realize that talking for an hour straight will make you thirsty. I usually get to take a pull off my iced tea while Jeb is uh, is giving his real estate answers. So um, hard to go in great detail about it, but we used to say that if you had a credit score above 740 and a down payment 5% or definitely 10% or above, you would look at conventional loans. That was because despite the fact that FHA rates are lower by about a half percent on average, the conventional rates for those well-qualified borrowers have lower mortgage insurance and they don't have an upfront mortgage insurance premium. That leads us to the number one biggest downside with an FHA loan. You put three and a half percent down, but then you finance 1.75% back on top of that to cover a portion of your mortgage insurance premium. So you make a three and a half percent down payment, you end up with a little less than 1.75% equity in the property, a little more than 1.75%. Everything else, lower interest rate. Mortgage insurance is now 0.55%. You're able to go to a higher debt to income ratio. On nearly every guideline, FHA loans are more flexible than the conventional loan. So I see more and more people where when we pencil them out side by side, despite the fact of that downside of that 1.75 upfront mortgage insurance premium, that they go, I don't care. The, 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 the payment is so much lower and I qualify for so much more that I'm going to go that route. So the most important thing is talk to a mortgage professional who is comfortable and familiar with both. If anyone tells you, hey, that's a terrible loan program, you don't want that, just tell them to go pound sand. Like, cool. So show me side by side and walk me through the pros and cons of, of each one. They've already shown a tip their hand that they have a bias. Um, I'm not biased. I do not care in terms of loans. Every loan we do, we're going to make the same amount of money on. So there's no financial incentive. Um, they're all 
essentially pretty much the same uh, for your loan officer. So if you get someone that's saying, hey, don't do that loan, don't do that loan, it's probably because they're not familiar with them, not comfortable with them, or their company doesn't have attractive terms on those. In terms of requirements, three and a half percent down, uh, 47 over 57 debt to income ratio. So I can already hear people saying that's crazy. No one should be able to buy with a 47 percent debt to income ratio. Look at the default rates on those loans. Um, it's proven very effective over time to have low default rates. Only in 2007, 2008 did we ever get short on the FHA mortgage insurance fund. I should say the last and other downside to some people, mortgage insurance with a minimum down with the three and a half, five percent down is going to be on an FHA loan for the life of the loan. Um, the reality is most people will move or refinance that loan well before the mortgage insurance would have fallen off. Um, there are people here that show up every week and ask how they can get the mortgage insurance off their FHA loan, and it's just not possible. Um, so uh, it's it's a thing to consider. So really everything negative about it is, is mortgage insurance related. Jane has a comment here. It says, Greg, only 16% of Californians can afford to buy a home right now, likely even less in the Bay. Um, and that that's that's accurate. You got to go county by county, look at county level incomes. It's higher in, in more affordable areas, but where most Californians are, San Francisco, San Jose, Orange County, LA County, San Diego County, those prices are high. Even, even uh, Sacramento, affordability is not quite what it was. All right, guys, we got a lot of good comments here, but I think we got most of the questions answered. Um, if you guys, well, I thought, I thought, Eli snuck back in here and says, are there factors other than lower rates and or higher unemployment that could cause more inventory to come on the market? Um, lower rates would hopefully spur more people. Um, higher unemployment would be forced sales, people who could no longer afford their homes. Um, I don't know how many of those people we have just because there's so much nested equity and low interest rates making payments so much lower than any other housing option that short of moving in with a family member or being homeless or just taking proceeds from uh, appreciation on a home and, and renting an apartment for a number of years and no longer being a homeowner. People will hold on for dear life. So it's not to say that it will not happen. I don't see it happening at scale. So um, there's just not a big impetus for people to move. And if we look at the long-term trends, when I got into the business in the 90s, people always said, hey, average time uh, length of tenure in a home is seven years. Most people will refinance at least once. So every client that you get, keep them happy, stay in contact with them because about every three and a half to five years, that's going to be a potential transaction. And now that's way over 10 years, like 11 to 12 years. That was before this interest rate lock-in stuff uh, hit. I wouldn't be shocked if five years from now we look and those numbers are 15 years in a home. Um, so it, it's interesting. You, you know, we talk, uh, I was going to throw in a chart today showing um, mortgage volume. Uh, refinance activity is almost nil. I talked earlier in the show about a refinance we're doing right now. We usually do about one at a time. Uh, right now, instead of 10 or 15 at, in process at any given time, uh, and purchases for uh, for applications for purchases are way, way down as well, like 25, 35%. So when you have what was 60% of the market is now zero, and the remaining 35% is 25% below what it was, not a recipe for success for an industry. Um, you know, people who've been in the business, like myself, have a big database, have an audience, have people that they stay in communication with. Um, it's just, it's very different, very different market than it was two, three years ago. Um, it'll be interesting to see what it looks like two to three years from now. I think some of it is good. We're washing out a lot of the people who were either less experienced, less less ethical, or in the business just because they thought it was easy money. Um, seeing a lot of that washed out and the people that are left are truly professionals with a heart to serve to give financial information and help from, from that end. Jane, uh, you're asking, did you give a recap of what the market has been like? We started the show off with the slides and Jeb provided all of his slides. So we walked through that. So yeah, just go back to the beginning, take a peek at that and uh, and go from there. Ooh, we actually have a good question. I'm glad, I'm glad we're still here. Focus Lotus. I like the, the rhyming name there. Focus Lotus is currently working for a refi shop and that boggles my mind. 
just so you guys know, in a normal market, a refi shop is happy to spend $1,000 in marketing to generate one closed loan. That number's got to be close to $3,000 in the current market because there are so few refinances out there and still so many people trying to, to make a, a living in that uh, industry. But I digress. Is it unethical to be rolling in credit card debts and other debts into mortgages? My, my initial thoughts, I want to say absolutely not. Um, home equity is another asset. So if you are overweighted towards home equity and you have way too much debt, um, it, rebalancing that makes sense. If you're doing the right thing and looking at keeping the first and looking at the second mortgage, seeing what that looks like in terms of blended rate and total payment. But if someone goes from a 3% interest rate to a 7% interest rate, but their payments go from a $1,200 mortgage and $4,000 of credit cards, so $5,200 total to $2,700, $2,700, I need some more iced tea to $2,700, you've put them in a better position. It is incumbent upon you as a loan officer to say, here is the good thing. We just went from $5,200 a month to $2,700 a month. You're paying a higher interest rate. You're starting back at 30 years. What I would love to see you do is take a portion of that savings, $500, $1,000, and make additional principal payments. And we are going to stay in touch. I'm going to call you quarterly until this market gets to a point where that interest rate, it makes sense for you to ride it down and lower it. So um, if you're just looking at ways to generate business, or if you're taking someone with a great rate, you know, $400,000 loan at two and a half percent, and they've got $50,000 of credit cards, hey, let's do it all at four and a half. The numbers, they probably will not go for it. But just saying it's all in how you present it and is there a true benefit? And most lenders are going to say, show me the net tangible benefit to the borrower. Why do they want to do this? What is the benefit to them? Um, so not just straight up unethical uh, across the board, but hey, Focus Lotus actually follows up with another follow. Also, the company I'm working for is promising to refinance again in six months to get their rate back to where it was. That's absurd and that's bullshit. Um, <laughs> we don't know. We do not know where rates are going to be six months from now. Um, do I think they're going to be anywhere near where most of these people are today, six months from now? I will compare this. I know a guy that has a big refi shop. When rates first spiked up last year, there was a lender that has a cool program. It's a six-month arm. It adjusts every six months. And when rates had gone to about four and a half, those were at like 2.75%. And they were telling everyone, hey, do this. And in six to 12 months, rates are going to drop back down. We'll come back and put you back in the same exact rate. And what are you looking at? That 2.75 rate, uh, it's tied to SOFR. SOFR a shot to the moon. Those are like 8%, 8.5% rates right now. And I assure you that everyone that was promised it was going to be okay. It's just a promise that you can't make. We don't know what's going to happen with interest rates. We don't know that that person's not going to lose their job. We don't know that property values aren't going to drop. If it's FHA or VA or USDA where you can do a streamline without an appraisal, you can at least say without an appraisal and without income. So those people should be able to make their payment, but even, or be able to, to refinance. But even in that situation, you miss a payment, you're not gonna be eligible to refinance. So there's things that are outside of our control. For those of you still watching here, we've got 143 of you, I appreciate it. If you look at both your loan estimate and your closing disclosure, the last page of it, it literally goes through there says, there's, there's no guarantee you'll ever be able to refinance. So if anyone's telling you, hey, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, it's just, it's not true. Every refi shop in the world says, come back, we'll do a free refinance in six months. And what they really mean is they're going to get a, a rebate from the lender that's going to compensate them. They're going to make money on the loan and cover the closing costs. No one does, does loans for free. Uh, everyone in that space says they do, but no one actually does. T. Tucker has a good comment here. Maybe a good percentage of people that bought recently will have to force sell due to interest staying higher for longer and inflation still being a problem. That's where forced sales would be most likely to come from. We talk a lot about the American Enterprise Institute. They have really good data. They track the market really closely. And their feeling is forced sales will not be an issue, but they will be highest in areas that had greater affordability, greater concentration of FHA loans and it will be felt most among those that came in late. So if you bought in Austin with an FHA loan in 2022 at 
you know, four and a half percent when everyone else is at three percent, you would be more likely to lose that home or have to sell it or do a short sale or it it get foreclosed than anyone else. So absolutely correct. But if you look, we have a lot less homes. We went from 6 million annual sales rate to 4 million. So in the last year and a half, we sold as many homes as we did in the year before that. So there's less of them. Um, what I will say for the most part, the buyers that I'm working with right now are stronger financially than the ones that we were working with then. People were feeling good and feeling this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I'm going to be a little riskier and and kind of jump in and make this happen. Whereas the people now are like, I need a house. This is where I am in my life. I'm, I'm moving up. I'm moving laterally. I'm moving to into my first home, but I need a house. I got kids. I got a wife. I got a husband, whatever. Um, so definitely some logic there. I don't know that that's really going to play out that way, um, but that would be where the weakness would absolutely be seen first and most. So with that, guys, it's about 620. I have a viewer here that is expecting a phone call from me. So I'm going to jump off and take that. Appreciate you guys being here uh, again, as always. If you're here on Jeb's channel and you're not aware of the podcast, every Tuesday, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, uh, we covered assumable loans this week. We covered the whole student loan payment restarting and how that's likely to impact the housing market last week and next week. No, that was what we did yesterday. Next week will be the assumable loan. So check that out. If you need a professional anywhere in the country, Jeb has an awesome network of realtors. We have an awesome network of mortgage people. If you're on the West Coast, chances are most states you're going to get to talk to me. So if that's a positive thing, uh, reach out. Use Jeb's referral link there. Uh, we'll get you connected uh, to a professional anywhere throughout the country. If it's me, look forward to talking to you guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for asking good questions. And with that, I will uh, I will give the whole saying for Jeb. Adios, amigos.